Okay, so we talked about those um, place values and we talked about the different parts of a number yesterday and saw a little bit about how that fits together with some of the things we've done in the past. So to start off today, I want to take a look at how that all ties together with some of the larger <coughs> operations or larger procedures that we've all seen in math. Dealing with larger numbers. We saw yesterday that we can have numbers like 364, and the fact that that's just an abbreviation of the true number. The, the true number, or the full form of that number, looks like this. 300s and 610s and 41s. And we saw from this, one of the consequences of this is now we can see that each digit of the number has a count and a name. This is not just a 3, it's 3 hundreds. Not just a 6, it's 6 tenths. And so those rules that we learned yesterday for the count and the name in our operations apply to these larger numbers through that form, through that place value. And if you recall, when we add numbers or subtract numbers, we can only combine things that have the same name. And when we do that, we combine the counts and we keep the same name. When we multiplied, we don't have to have the same name, and we combine counts, and we also combine the names. So let's do an addition example here. Let's say I'm going to add to this 425. So I'm going to write that out in its long form too, 400s and 210s and 5 ones. Now, one thing that's always been pounded into us when we add or subtract multiple digit numbers is we were told you have to line up the columns, right? So the question is, why? Well, we see each digit here has a count and a name. And when we add, we can only combine things that have the same name. So these six tens here can only combine with the other tens. The hundreds can only combine with the other hundreds and so on. So that's why we have to line up our columns. Is we're, we're just making sure that we're only combining things when we add and subtract that have the same name. Once those columns are lined up, we can go ahead and just add down the columns. 3 plus 4 is 7 hundreds. 6 plus 2 is 8 tens. 4 plus 5 is 9 ones. 789. Now some of you might be looking at that thinking, he did something a little off there. Anybody tell me what it was? Yeah, I started on the left and I went to the right. We're used to starting on the right at the end of the number and working our way back to the left. Why do we usually do it that way? In case not round, but carry. There you go. Got the right word. Um, in case we have to carry, you can run into problems like 374 plus 298. We start on the right and we work our way back to the left because we run into this. 4 plus 8 is 12. Well, we can't have two digits in the same place. So we're going to keep the 2 and we're going to carry the 1 over into the next place. We combine the 1 with the 7 to make 8. And then 8 plus 9 is 17. Well, again, we can't have two digits there. So we keep the 7 and we carry the 1 to the next place. 1 combines a 3 to make 4. Plus the 2 is 6. So we get 672. And that's the way we've, pretty much all of us have, have probably been taught how to add our large numbers. Going from right to left and carrying. Believe it or not though, that process of carrying is a relatively new process. Now by relatively new, I mean 150 to 200 years old. Before that process, one of the possible ways this might have been added would look like this. Now, you don't have to write this down. I'm never going to force you to do it this way. I'll explain why I'm showing you this in just a minute. So same problem, but we could have gone 3 plus 2 is 5. 7 plus 9 is 16, so 6 drop the 1. 4 plus 8 is 12, so 2 drop the 1. You get the same answer. Notice it's a little bit longer. It takes a little more space. But the point of me showing you that is I'm not trying to change how you add. 
but it's just to, sh to make a point where we're so used to being told that there's only one right way to do math. Well, there's only one right answer, but there are several different processes and procedures you can take to get to that answer. Looks like the lesson way to camera. Yeah. I have uh, used to do some workshops for high school teachers, and I kind of stopped because they're kind of tied down to whatever textbook they're using in most cases. So. Yeah, my attitude, the reason I show you this is you may have a different way of doing it, and if it makes sense to you and it's something you remember, my, my goal is for you to learn something that you're going to remember for the rest of your life. Not memorize the way I want you to do it and then forget it in two weeks after you spit it out on a test. So, I mean, you may come up with a totally different way of doing things that work. As long as it's something you remember, that's all I care about. Like I said, I'm not trying to change it. I just want you to see that there are different things. No. Well, what they're doing there, that, uh, that uh, what do they call it, core math? Or, yeah, that is area 100 or mm -hmm. Um. I don't want to get into a big political discussion about it. There's, and I'm not going to bash the curriculum. Most people would just flat out bash the curriculum, but it's actually a very, very good curriculum. The problem is they're forcing it and they're not training the teachers correctly. You'll see me do some very long calculations in my head up here. And the reason for that is math is all about patterns. Once you start to see those patterns, the calculations are really simple. So what that core math or whatever it is, or common core math, that's the word I was looking for, what that is is they're trying to teach them to see those patterns and do those patterns. The problem that they're get coming to is they're, they're picking a pattern and they're trying to force the, this, each kid to see that same pattern and do that pattern. And they're not teaching the pattern to the teacher, so the teacher doesn't know the pattern. So all the teacher is doing is looking at an example in the textbook and telling the kids, okay, you got to do this, this, and this. And nobody's really explaining why you're doing it. They just do this, this, and this. like a problem like this. One of the things you could have done is you could have made this 300, right? Because that's plus two, right? Well, 374 plus 300 is 674, and then take the two away. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the types of things they would show you. Well, they're not saying why. Well, the reason is, is if I'm estimating this and that, and this is one of the things I would do if I'm calculating in my head. Well, that's almost 300. I'd just add 300 and back off by two because it's two less. But they're not telling them that this is not, this isn't a natural process. It's a way of estimating and way of working with a pattern. And, sure. and the problem is, is most of the teachers that are trying to teach the curriculum don't get that either. And the other problem is, you could look at a pattern and we could both look at the same problem and see a totally different pattern. So trying to force you to do the pattern that I see is just going to confuse you because that's not the way everybody's mind works differently. One of the other ways you could have done this is, okay, this is less than two. I'm going to take two away from that, make it 372, and then add 300 to it. I get the same answer, but it's a slightly different pattern. And that, that, that's the problem with that common core math is they're trying, first of all, the teachers don't understand what they're trying to teach in many cases. And it's not their fault. They're, I think it's ridiculous to, and this is, this is my one political statement on the K-12 educational system. I think it's ridiculous from grades kindergarten through fourth or fifth grade to expect one teacher to be an expert in every topic. They can't do it. That'd be like asking me to teach your speech class or your written communications class. I, I could teach it, but I do a horrible job. You know, and I'm not saying they're doing a horrible job. It's just that they can't be an expert in everything. So yeah, that, that's my political statement. But I understand your frustration there. It's it's a very good idea, just implemented ex implemented extremely poorly. Yeah. Um, like I said, once you get to see those patterns, the calculations are easy. But you can't force it. You have to work with the numbers enough that this, the patterns become apparent to you, and your patterns become apparent to you, and not. Okay, here's a pattern. You're going to learn this pattern. You're going to use this pattern. It doesn't work. Yeah. Okay, I'll shut up now. I'll get off my soapbox. Um, so anyway, I'm a realist. I also realize you guys have calculators, and you're going to use them. I mean, a three-digit addition is not something many people would do by hand unless they're forced to. 
I think there's one quiz that we do in here where I ask you to do the first six problems without a calculator. And after that, you'll use a calculator for everything in here. But anyway, if you're going to put this in the calculator, the one thing I would ask is you at least do this. Is you look at this and say, okay, this is close to 400. This is close to 300. 4 and 3 makes about 7, so I'm expecting an answer close to 700. So if I punch this in the calculator, if I get 672, that's reasonable to me. I know that that sounds about right. The reason I stress that, and the reason it's very important to me, like for me, I've got these kind of fat fingers, and when I'm using a calculator, it's, it's not uncommon for something like this to happen to me. 374 plus 298. What went wrong there? I the, nine. the 9 didn't register when I hit it. I missed it. But if I'm not paying attention, I punch it in the calculator, it spits out 402, I write that down, and I go on with life, and well, I pay for it later because something goes wrong because my answer is incorrect. Um, I used to be a structural engineer before I came here, so an issue like that can cause a lot of big problems. Or the other thing that sometimes goes wrong is you can do 374 plus 298. What happened there? Hit the nine twice, or you hit a hit an extra key. You went to hit the eight, and I hit the nine again. You get an extra digit in there. Well, again, well, thirty-three seventy-two. That what the calculator said. It must be right. I write it down and go on. Just by looking at the numbers and just getting an idea in your head of what you're expecting before you punch in the calculator. Stop some of those. I mean, it's not going to guarantee it's right. I mean, I can still hit a wrong key, and it comes up with something close to what it should be but it avoids some of the really, really bad mistakes. Now, just like we were saying with that common core math here, I didn't show you this estimate because I want you to all estimate it this way. I want you to come up with your own way of estimating. Just, even if you just look at it and get a feel for the numbers, come up with some way that you can do that's easy for you, that works well. Because if you're trying to memorize the way I want you to estimate and you don't like it, you're not going to do it. You may do it once or twice, and if it's, a, if it's a pain to do it, you're just not. Come up with some way that's easy for you. Even if you're just looking at the numbers, some people can just look at them and get a feeling for what they have to be or what, about what it's going to be. Have some sense before you punch it in the calculator. So. Okay, let's look at subtraction. Let's do something like 576 minus 200 and... 51. Now I could write these all out in their long form again, but I think you guys get the point that when we add or subtract, we have to line up those columns because we can only combine digits that have the same place value. So I'm not going to bother doing that this time around. Once we have them lined up, just like addition, we can go ahead and just subtract down the columns. 5 minus 2 is 3, 7 minus 5 is 2, 6 minus 1 is 5. What did I do again? Yeah, I went left to right, and we're used to going right to left. When we subtract, we go right to left in case we have to. Not carrying with subtraction, but same concept. Borrowing, yeah. Same idea. So we have 625 minus 397. We were used to starting on the right and going backwards to the left. Because we run into this. 5 minus 7 can't be done, so what do we do? Borrow from the 2. That becomes a 1, and this is a 15. Now, some of you are probably taught just put the 1 in front of the 5. That's fine as well. 15 minus 7 is 8. 1 minus 9 can't be done, so we have to borrow from the 6. That's 5, and now this is 11. 11 minus 9, 2. 5 minus 3 is 2. So 228. Now again, there are other ways of doing this. Um, before borrowing became popular, one of the ways this would have been done or could have been done, 6 minus 3 is 3. 2 minus 9 can't be done, so we take from the 3, and this is a 2, and a 12. 12 minus 9 is 3. 5 minus 7 can't be done, take from the 3, it's a 2, this is a 15. 15 minus 7 is 8, so 228. Again, I'm not trying to change how you do things, just to show you that there are other ways. 
Again, I realize the calculators are there. They're going to get used. But I'd at least hope you look at this and say, okay, that's close to 600. That's close to 400. Subtracting to get something around 200. So 228 is in the right ballpark. It makes sense. One note I will make about the estimates I do. I mean, the, two pro the problems I've done with addition and subtraction so far, the estimating was fairly easy with the way I do it. I mean, you guys might come up with a different method because they have the same number of digits. You know, if I'm trying to combine estimates that look like this, it's pretty simple because when I add or subtract, I keep the same name and I can only combine things that have the same name. I can combine the 8 and the 3 because they're both in the hundreds digits. It's subtraction, so 8 minus 3 is 5. Then I just bring down the zeros because I keep the same name when I add or subtract. But if I had something like this, can I combine the 2 and the 4? No, because they're not in the same place value. So I'd have to have the tw take a 20. 20 minus 4 is 16, and then I can bring down the zeros. So the estimating, I've used fairly simple examples so far, but the estimating can get a little more complex. In fact, if I had a problem like this that needed to be estimated like that, let's say it's 2,384 minus 396. You might not even round it off to 2,400. You might round it off to 2,400 and 400, so that when you subtract it, your estimate is 2,000. So how you estimate, like I said, there's a lot of different ways to do the estimates. Let's look at multiplication. Let's do 32 times 21. This time I am going to write these out in their long form. So three tens and two ones. And this is going to be two tens and one one. When we multiply, do we need to have the same name? No, we don't. So what that means is these three tens here not only can be combined with these two tens, but it can also be combined with the one one. In fact, when we multiply, because we don't need the same name, every digit of the top number can be combined with every digit of the bottom number. And that's exactly what our long multiplication problem or process is. It's just an organized method of making sure every digit in the top number gets combined with every digit in the bottom number. The way we do this actually varies regionally depending on what part of the country you went to school in. And if you went to a school in a different country, you learned a very different process too. It all has the same end. But the way around here, the way we, we do this is we pick the last digit of the bottom number, right here. And we start with that. We're going to multiply every digit of the top number by that. So we start out, we do 1, 1 times the 2 ones, the last digit of the first number, the top number, the first one. So just like any other multiplication, we combine the counts. 1 times 2 is 2. But we also combine the names. 1s times 1s, well, it's just 1s, right? 1 times 1 is 1. Then we combine the 1, 1 with the 3, 10s. 1 times 3, 3, 1s times 10s, just 10s. Now, every digit in the top number has been combined with that 1, 1. So we can move over to the next digit. What have we been taught to do down here before we move over? Put in a 0 or leave a space, right? We're going to put in a 0 there. So now we have the two tens. We're going to combine it with the two ones. Two times two is four. Tens times ones is tens. That's why we had to put that zero in there, so that we line up the tens with the other tens. Now we've got the two tens and the three tens. Two times three is six. Tens times tens is hundreds. So you can see the reason we do a lot of the stuff here, you know, having to put in the zero or leave the space and all that is so that we keep the right the place values in the right location in the number. 
So it's ones, tens, hundreds in the right location. So now we can combine them. Two tens has nothing to combine, or two ones has nothing to combine with, so that's just two. Three tens and four tens make seven tens, 600, so 672. Now once again, I'm, I know you're not going to do a lot of long multiplication. So at the very least, I'm hoping that before you punch the calculator, you're looking at that is 32 is about 30, 21 is about 20, 2 times 3 is 6, tens times tens is hundreds. If you're hoping for an answer, close to 600. 672 is reasonable. A note on that estimate there, by the way. When we added or subtracted, we keep the same names. We just had to bring the zeros down. When we multiply, we combine the names. So tens times tens had to become hundreds. The shortcut for doing that is to just combine the zeros. You have one, two zeros. You have two zeros in your answer. So if I'm estimating something like 20,000 times 400, I can do 2 times 4 is 8. Then I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 zeros. 88 million. Make sense? Only thing to be careful for is something like this. Let's say I have 5,000 times 80,000. Well, 5 times 8 is 40. This zero here doesn't count. That's part of the five and the eight. We still have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We need seven more zeros on the end of that. So don't let this zero here confuse you. Now, if we're estimating the other way, by the way, division, let's say we had 80,000 divided by 400. When we multiplied, we combined the zeros, we counted them up, and we had the total zeros. When we, when we divide, you can think of it as subtracting the zeros or canceling the zeros. We're dividing by a number with two zeros, so I'm going to cancel two zeros off of the first number. So now it's just 8 divided by 4 is 2, and we have the two zeros left. 200 is our estimate. If we run into something like this, Seventy thousand divided by two hundred. Well, we cancel out the two zeros, so now it's seven hundred divided by two is our estimate. Obviously, seven doesn't divide neatly by two, so the way you estimate this, there's a couple ways. The way I do it is this: if the seven doesn't divide by two, I'll take a zero with it. I'll take seventy divided by two, which is just thirty-five, and then we have the one zero left. You could, however, say, hey, there's two zeros. Seven divided by two, well, three is too small, four is too big, so my estimate is it's between 300 and 400. Remember, this is just estimating, so we don't have to have an exact answer. It's okay to just come up with a range and say, well, our answer has to be somewhere in that range. Okay. My point, again, is the way you estimate, each of you might have a different way of estimating. Come up with something that you can do and that you will do. Okay, before we talk about division, I want to point out some things about multiplication. Just kind of do a, we we did the process along multiplication, but we didn't really define what multiplying was. It kind of depended on your, your knowledge of the multiplication facts. If I have something like 5 times 3, if you think back to when you first learned to multiply, somewhere around second grade or so, before you memorized your multiplication facts and you knew that 5 times 3 was 15, how did you figure that out? Yeah, 5 plus 5 plus 5. You did repeated addition. 5 times 3 means you're taking the 5 three times. So multiplication, the literal definition of multiplication is repeated addition. 
Well, I made a big deal yesterday about multiplication and division being the same. Just one's going forward, one's going in reverse. So if multiplication is defined as repeating addition, division can be defined as repeated subtraction. 24 divided by 8 can be looked at like this. If I take 24 and I subtract 8, I get 16. Subtract 8 again, I get 8. Subtract 8 again, I get 0. I was able to subtract 8 1, 2, 3 times. That's how you were taught? Yeah, you don't see that much anymore. 24 divided by 8 is 3 because you can subtract 8 from 24 3 times. There's nothing left over, so it divides evenly. You might have something like 32 divided by 7. Actually, let's do this is a little less confusing. 33 divided by 7. So 33 minus 7 is 26. Subtract 7 again gives me 19. Subtract 7 gives me 12. Subtract 7 again, 5. Can't subtract 7 again, or unless I want to go negative. So I subtracted 1, 2, 3, 4 times. So 33 divided by 7 is 4. And there's 5 left over, so for the remainder of 5. Yeah, you can do it. I mean, I'm most likely, I usually won't ask you to write out remainders. Um, but yeah, any way you write, as long as it's clear what it is, it's fine. I'm just a little kid. Yeah, I'm not really picky about your forms. So. Now, this is one thing. There are going to be times where having a remainder is more desirable than having it as a fraction or a decimal. That's one thing your calculator doesn't do for you as a remainder. Uh, if you divide that out in your calculator, 33 divided by 7 is going to give you something like 4.714286 approximately. How do you convert that into a remainder? That's one of the things we'll look at when we do fractions. Actually, fractions is one of the applications where the remainder is more useful than the decimal. So we'll look at how you do that when we get there. So anyway, we've talked about, we, we've defined now division as being repeated subtraction. Let's look at our process of long division and see how that fits in. So let's say I take something like 68,586. And I'm going to divide by 21. Well, despite what I just said, I am not about to start subtracting 21 from 68,000. We'd be here for a while. But if I look, let's look at a simpler example. Let's look at something like if I'm dividing like 27 divided by 2. Rather than start again and subtracting 2 from 27, I could subtract 20 from 27. What did I just do there? Well, I just took a bundle of 10 twos and subtracted them all at once. I know 20 is 10 twos, so I just subtracted it 10 times, and now I can go from there. Does that make sense? Okay. No? Okay. Um, all long division is is an organized method of subtracting that number in large bunches. So instead of subtracting 21, I'm going to try to subtract 1,000 or 10,000 21s all at once and then keep track of it. Now what I'm about to do here, you don't have to write down because I'm never going to ask you to do it this way, but it's going to show you where our process of long division comes from. So I just said I'm going to try to subtract big bundles of 21s. Well, how do I know how big of a bundle? Well, that starts with the number I'm dividing here, and that's the 68,000. What's the place value of this first digit? 10,000, right? So 10,000 times 21 is 210,000. Can I subtract that? No, it's too big. So that's telling me is I cannot subtract a bundle of 10,021. It's too big. What's my next place value then? 1,000. So 1,000 times 21 is 21,000. Can I subtract that? Yeah, no, technically what I should do is subtract 21,000 once, subtract it again, and so on, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to shorten that up. I can, I can see I can subtract it more than once. How many times can I subtract it? Three times. 
So I'm just going to do this. 21,000 times 3 is 63,000. Give me 6, 8, 5, and 5. So what I just did there was I subtracted a bundle of 1,021s. But how many times did I subtract it? Three times. So 1,000 times 3 is 3,000. I just subtracted 3,021. I just subtracted 3, 000, or 21 3,000 times if you want to look at it that way. Next. Next place value is 100 times 21. It's 2,100. Can I take that away from what's left? I sure can. Looks like twice. 2,100 times 2 is 4,200. Leaving us 6, 8, 3, and 1. Now again, I just subtracted a bundle of 121s how many times? Twice. So I just subtracted 21 200 more times. Next place value? 10. 10 times 21 is 210. I can subtract that. Let's see what? Six times? 1260. 126. So again, I just subtracted a bundle of 10 21s six times. So I subtracted 21 60 more times. And now, of course, I just have 21. 21 times 6 is 126. I have nothing left over. So I subtracted it 6 more times. So what I have here is 3,266. 68,586 divided by 21 is 3,266, because I can subtract 21, 3,266 times. Now, you might be looking at this thinking, okay, that looks nothing like the way I was taught too long division. And at first glance, it doesn't look anything like it. But it's actually exactly the process you were taught. The process all of us were taught came from what I just did here. We just leave out steps and we abbreviate steps and we shorten it down to make it take up less space and take less time. How are we taught to divide? Well, we start with our 21. Does 21 go into 6? No, so we leave it blank here. Well, that's exactly what we did to start here. We started with the 10,000s place, which came from the 6. 10,000 times 21 was 210,000. We couldn't take that out. So it's blank there. Same thing, just looks a little different. We didn't explain why we were looking at it that way. We just did it. Move to the next digit is the 8. So 68. Is 21 going to 68? Yeah, three times. 3 times 21 is 63. We subtract to get 5. Now, again, this looks very different. But if we come up here, we see... Actually, it's the exact same thing. All we did was... Come on. Leave out the zeros. So we're just leaving, we're abbreviating stuff. So of course over here our next step was to bring down the next digit, which is the 5. I always use that arrow to bring down the digits so that way I can trace back up and make sure I don't miss one or forget one. And then we did 21 goes into 55 twice times 21 is 42. Again, same thing, we just left off the zeros. I'm not going to go ahead and finish that. You're going to get the same answer, but you get the point. It is the same process. It's just extremely abbreviated. They like said long division is the one process when the most abbreviated and changed and altered. It's all been done to try to simplify it and make it easier and faster for you to do. The problem is, is we've lost the meaning of why we do it. They've become processes we just memorize now rather than understanding what we're really doing. And long division is nothing more than just repeated subtraction, organized subtraction. Now again, back to the realist side of this. Um, long division is the one operation I try not to do by hand if I can avoid it, just to be totally honest. But I would hope that you at least look at this before you punch it in the calculator and say 68,000, well that's about 70,000. 20, one is about 20. When I divide, cancel out a zero. I'm going to do the 70 divided by 2 is 35 with two zeros. I'm expecting an answer around 3,500. I get 3,266. That's in the ballpark. Make sense? Okay. 
Normally, this is about when lectures will end, is somewhere around 9.05 to 9.15. I'll give you anywhere from 5 to 15 minutes or so, sometimes maybe up to 20 minutes to get started on your homework assignment. Today, there is going to be a homework in your book on pages 8 through 10. Problems 1 through 70, and actually probably 1 through 69 would be a better way of saying it. Do this and give some word problems and stuff like that, story problems. I have you only do the odd numbered problems for a couple of reasons. One is to shorten it a little bit for you so you don't have 70 problems to do. Two is in about three minutes I'm going to hand out a packet that has the solutions to all the odd numbered problems in your textbook. Remember I said I don't collect your homework. So I'll give you the solution so you can check your own answers. For Again, because I don't check it, I want you to know you're doing it right. But also, I'd rather have you do a couple of problems and check your answer and make sure you're doing it correctly then I don't want you to do a whole assignment and then realize you've done it wrong and now you've developed a bad habit. But I don't want you to have to do that. So please check your answers as you're going. If you get one wrong, try to figure out what you did wrong. If you can't figure out what you did wrong, that's where we'll start class tomorrow. You can ask me to, to go through it and help you figure it out. Um, kind of a side note, I know I mentioned it yesterday, but especially these first few assignments, First few problems are pretty easy. If you do the first couple of problems, they seem extremely easy. Feel free to skip ahead a few problems. Just don't do the more difficult ones. Like I said yesterday, I don't want you doing busy work on stuff you already know how to do. Do enough that you're comfortable that you know that if there happens to be a quiz tomorrow when you come into class, you're comfortable taking. 